Where were you on 9-11? I remember where I was, and it's one of only two days in my life of 68 years that I remember exactly the moment when I heard the news. The other being the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in November 1963. And 9-11 for me will always be the same. My parents, it was Pearl Harbor, BE Day, BJ Day. But for me, it's the Kennedy assassination and 9-11. Those are days I'll never forget in my life. I woke up this morning. I knew it was 9-11, the anniversary. And I also knew that I had to make a video about it. Not for, you know, views or subscriptions. I mean, there's so many going to be produced today that mine will get lost in the shuffle. I'm not worried about that. I'm not even going to include a title. You know, there won't be any of the usual, you know, begs or subscriptions to share or any of those things. But I just want to produce the video so I can feel like I did it. And that, that's really all I'm trying to do today. Morning of 9-11. I was sitting in my office. I was the uh, chair of the Department of History at East Carolina University. And I was working on my computer and I had CNN alerts on. Those were the days when CNN was an actual news network rather than propaganda network. And an alert popped up. It said that a plane had flown into one of the Twin Towers in New York City. And I remember my first thought was, things like this have happened before. World War II, a B-25 bomber flew into the Empire State Building. And I remember thinking, boy, somebody screwed up. You know, some pilot's going to be uh, fired for this. But then it wasn't that much long later. Another alert popped up. A second plane had flown into the second tower. And I remember my heart dropping because I knew at that moment this was something different. And I knew what it was. This had to be terrorism. By this time, people were starting to gather outside my office in the area of the uh, administrative suite for the history department. There were three administrative assistants in those days. There was a, uh, a student worker and also several faculty had come down and they were sort of gathering outside my office wondering what the hell was going on. So I walked out and they asked me what I thought. Uh, and I told them terrorism. And they said, terrorism? But who? Who would do this? And I said, give me a second. And I walked back into my office, and in the drawer on the right-hand side, the lower drawer, I pulled it out, and I pulled out a folder. And I walked back out into the office suite, and I said, this guy. And the folder had three words on it, Osama bin Laden. And I opened up, had a picture, and I told him, this is the guy who did it. Somebody asked me, did we know anything about him? And I said, we knew plenty. He's been responsible for this, 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 the attack on the destroyer in Yemen, uh, Aden, and on and on and on. And I said, he even was interviewed on 2020 by John Miller. And I had the transcript. I showed him the transcript. And somebody said, could I get the link to that? So I said, sure. So we walked into my office and I searched the ABC News link. And eventually I found it. And I opened it up, and it had, you know, it had been formatted differently from when I had printed it out a couple of years before. And I scrolled down, and I had my second shock of 9-11. During the interview in the tent with Osama bin Laden, John Miller had ended the interview with an observation. This guy, John Miller, compared Osama bin Laden to Teddy Roosevelt. He actually said something like, you're the Middle East version or the Arab version of Teddy Roosevelt. And he made that comparison, which I thought was totally inane at the time. And it looked even more inane, downright ridiculous, after the morning of 9-11. And lo and behold, when I got to the end of the interview where that part was, it had been removed. ABC had already gone into their interview and cut off the part where their correspondent had compared Osama bin Laden, who was already starting to be blamed in the media for these attacks, with Teddy Roosevelt. And that was the uh, my second big alert that something fantastic was up here, because the media was already covering its tracks for some of the crappy coverage that they had been feeding us in the lead up to 9-11, the years before, during 
other terrorist attacks in, in Somalia, uh, in uh, uh, East Africa, Tanzania, the embassy building, and the attack on the destroyer in Aden. And I thought, boy, this, is, this doesn't look good at all. And I should add, later on, they did repost it with it there because I think people, people like me knew it was missing and that they had taken it down. You know, fake news. Fake news. This is long before Donald Trump. We were witnessing fake news on 9-11 on that morning. The other thing that pretty quickly became apparent to me was more fake news because of the documents I'd collected in that folder was one on a name change. Al-Qaeda was no longer known as Al-Qaeda. In June 2001, before the attack, several months, Al-Qaeda, whose leader was Osama bin Laden, had merged with Egyptian Islamic Jihad, whose leader was Ayman al-Zawahiri. And basically, Ayman al-Zawahiri became number two in the new group. Osama bin Laden became number one. And the new group was called Qaeda al-Jihad, not al-Qaeda. And ever since 9-11, I have yet to hear anybody in the media refer to al-Qaeda by its actual name, Qaeda al-Jihad. And if you were around then and you were paying attention, you know why. Because one of the big debates that occurred after 9-11 was the whole question of use of a term jihad. Apologists for Islam, be they Muslim or college professors or specialists and experts in the United States, consistently told us that the word jihad didn't mean blowing crap up. It didn't mean killing people. It didn't mean terrorism. Jihad to Muslims just means striving to be better at something. You could be have a jihad, personal jihad to be a better doctor, a better student, a better teacher. And all of that's true. But that's not how Osama bin Laden was using it. But it didn't look good that the name of the group that actually blew up the Twin Towers and attacked the Pentagon, was probably trying to take out the Capitol, actually had in its name the word jihad. The official name of al-Qaeda then, since June 2001, this is before 9-11, to the present day is Qaeda al-Jihad. You'll never hear that in the American media because they don't want any association of terrorism with the word jihad, which they always excuse and offer reasons why it doesn't really mean what it says it did. Even though there are any number of terrorist groups with the word jihad right in their name, and we know damn well what it is they do and how they interpret that term. There's no doubt, to me at least, that the attacks on 9-11 were a wake-up call for the United States and the American people. But I also have no doubt that no sooner had those attacks concluded than groups in this country, the elites you might call them, be they Islamic apologists, be they academics, be they our experts on the region, all started to work diligently to put the American people back to sleep. And they did this through the use of language. You can't associate the word jihad with what had happened. So we couldn't be told that Qaeda al-Jihad was responsible for the attacks. We were told it was al-Qaeda, conveniently forgetting the other part of the name that came with the uh, merger with Egyptian Islamic Jihad. We couldn't use the word crusader anymore because that offended Muslims. I remember Bush got in trouble for that. We were even told repeatedly that Osama bin Laden and people like him had hijacked Islam. Hijacked. They weren't real Muslims. All which was this pure bull. They no more hijacked Islam than Martin Luther had hijacked Christianity. People like bin Laden and the uh, would-be Khalifa al-Baghdadi have offered consistently alternate interpretations of Islam. There's no single interpretation of Islam. 
That's why you have a split in Islam. You have Sunnis and Shia, and there's four or five types of Sunnis and different kinds of Shia, just as there is in Christianity. You've got Catholics, you've got you know, Unitarians, you've got Lutherans, you've got Methodists, you've got Baptists, etc. There are all these differences in Islam, as there are in Christianity. But one of those differences includes the groups that we associate with terrorism, but which we deny their legitimacy as Muslims, which is simply nonsense. Just as I said, as we were waking up, there were people in this country determined to put us back to sleep, to lull us into sleep so that we wouldn't take appropriate actions. And they're still at it today. They still lie about these movements. They still won't tell us the truth. They don't want to call them what they are. Even to this day, 19 years after the event, even the officials in Washington will not call al-Qaeda, Qaeda al-Jihad, which is its actual name. We're not even allowed to know that. They don't even want us to know that because they, it's too close an association with Islam. It destroys the narrative. So we have to be kept in the dark. They want us asleep. It's that simple. Groups like Qaeda al-Jihad and others are not new. They're almost a century old. They developed in the mid-1920s after the elimination of a caliphate, not by the West, not by imperialists, not by colonialists, but by the secular leader of modern Turkey, Kemal Ataturk. He's the one who did away with the caliphate. And after that, in response to this, Muslims went into a panic and they started forming these jihadist focused groups. One of the first was the Muslim Brotherhood. There was another out in British India. And these groups have now been around for a century. And what's important to keep in mind is that if you look at that century, each successive generation of these jihadists has been more numerous and more extreme. In your own life, think back. What was our opinion of Qaeda al-Jihad after 9-11? It was pretty bad. These guys were pretty extreme. But then along came the Islamic State, Khalifa al-Baghdadi, and they made Qaeda al-Jihad look like a bunch of slackers. And that's what I've been teaching students since 2003, that each group, each generation has been more numerous. There's more of them and more extreme. And 15 years from now, whatever groups are out there are going to be more numerous and more extreme because we've never addressed the fundamental problems that we're facing. We can't. We're not allowed to. We don't even know the contours of those problems to address them. We just keep waiting. We keep treading water, hoping that they go away. But it's not going to go away. In the long run, it's going to get worse. In the long run, and I think it's a question of when, not if, they will finally get a hold of nuclear devices, and there's no doubt that they will use them. The next step is a nuclear 9-11. I'm not saying it's going to happen next year. It might not even be this decade. It might be the decade after that. But if you look at the long scope of their operations back to the mid-1920s, as I said, each successive generation has been more numerous and more extreme than the one that came before it. That's not changing, and it's not likely to change anytime soon. Unless we wake up to the reality, the Islamic world wakes up to the reality, and the two of us together work to basically eliminate these people. And if we don't do that, it's just a question of when it happens. That's unfortunate, but that's my conclusion. See you next video.